Why isn't the delete button working? What's going uh, on here? Wow, this, this is cool. This supposed is supposed to work this way. Wow, this is crazy. Oh, uh, nice. Who, who this is something gives a shit? Sure. sure. This is oh, unbelievable. Oh, I see. You I know see. what? Buck Fim! Hey, how's it going, everyone? We got another crazy episode of Buck Fim coming up. I'm really excited about this episode. We've got an amazing guest online. We got Darren Cash of Turner and Townsend, who's going to be talking about a lot of great, great stuff going on in the uh, procurement and costing world, which is something that we do not talk about enough. This is not something, it's something that we we tend to complain about a lot later on when we're like, oh, we should have been paying close attention to the stuff that we're acquiring and the books that we're looking at. But we don't really take a look into, you know, bringing in some outside help to really help us organize our whole project from beginning to finish. So with all that said, I would like to welcome Darren to the guest video feed. What an intro. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I love these intros. You know, well, welcome yeah. to welcome to the cast, Darren. And um, you know, it's it's really exciting to have this part of the industry join on. And let us uh, so introduce yourself. Uh, let let the fans know what Turner and Townsend do and how the firm came to be. Yeah, sure. Thanks. First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Not too sure I can better the intro you just gave, but I'll give it a good start. <laughs> so, yeah. So I look after our cost management. Uh, service line across Canada and I'm also our corporate occupier sector lead for Canada as well. So Turner and Townsend, just a quick elevator pitch, we're a global independent professional services organization. We were formed in the UK in 1946 I think it was, so we're about 75 years old. Uh, we were hoping to have a nice celebration last year but our friendly COVID had an impact on that. Yeah, sure did. We <laughs> impacted quite a few things, we'll get onto that in a bit I'm sure, but um, you know, we have over 6,800 people globally, spread out over 110 offices, I think it is now, 45 countries. And our business predominantly focuses on providing program, project, and cost management services across three segments, real estate, infrastructure, and natural resources. So we, we cover quite a number of, of projects, quite a number of asset classes. And our journey in North America began in 1995. And our Canadian business was established in 2010 when Turner and Towns emerged with a company called CM2R. Oh, okay. If you, uh, for those listeners that might remember those, so Gerard McCabe is still our MD. Um, and right now, you know, we've grown quite quite exponentially over the last few years. We've got over 230 people now in Canada, and growing on a on a daily basis. That's huge. I mean, that's a, that's quite a portfolio to be able to handle that much. Uh that much across the board it's it's crazy it's really awesome to hear so i mean with turner and townsend being such a large company and with a breadth of services like that especially with like life cycle program design and you know procurement and cost and risk risk management and all that but where does a uh where does a company like turner and townsend enter and or exit a project yeah, so that's an interesting one. I mean, the good thing about our business, Dennis, is that we can really enter anywhere into the life cycle of a project. Um, but, you know, we, we're genuinely of the opinion that the best value for, for our clients in the industry at large is for us to enter the project right at the very outset. So before any esteemed organizations like WZMH are, are even appointed, you know, just making sure that we can we can really set up the project in a in a way that allows for a data-driven approach to budgets and schedules. Uh, it allows us to really embrace a culture of accountability and transparency and, and more importantly, collaboration. Yep. And it's just important for us, and I think for everyone in the industry, uh, to set projects up in the right way when it comes to cost and schedule and risk. Because if you don't do that, everyone's kind of chasing their tail right from the get-go and it becomes an issue. And that, that aspect of collaboration that I just talked about it kind of wanes away pretty quickly once there are budget issues or schedule issues. And, you know, the adversarial approach that sometimes we have in the construction industry tends to come to the fore pretty quickly. So we try and we try and encourage our clients to get us involved early. We're not obviously going to solve every issue that the industry has, but we certainly think by setting the project up in the right way for that cost, time and risk side that it will go a long way to helping the project be a success. 
Oh, of course. Organization is key. And, you know, with myself being a BIM manager, it's, you know, it, naming conventions and organization and having things in the right place is just a, you know, a big thing. And when it comes to especially like controls and being able to ad adapt to, to changes, you, you can't focus on everything at once. So having that, that extra hand help you through it is just amazing. Yeah, agreed. So, you know, data is obviously a massive term these days, you know, data about 15, 20 years ago was sheets of paper, but the, but now we're, we have the ability to access data so rapidly and at our fingertips. So how, how are Turner and Townsend leading the field in data capture? Yeah, I mean, data is a uh, big data has been on the on the agenda, the buzzword now for a number of years. If you said, I mean, we've let's start from the beginning. I mean, from our side, from a cost management side, standardization of data capture is of absolutely paramount importance. If you don't do that, how can you you use those that data, that information that you're gathering, and how can you help use it influence future projects? So. Uh, so my professional body, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, the RICS, we've done some pretty good work in that by developing something called the International Construction Measurement Standards. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the RICS is, is a UK, is a UK centric organization, but it has a, a massive global footprint. And to be honest with you, the take up of that ICMS has been fairly slow even though it has had buy-in and even uh, um, working members from organizations such as the CIQS, the Canadian Institute of Quantity Surveyors, mm -hmm. they, they were involved in, in the development of the ICMS, but for whatever reason in Canada, it's been fairly slow in the adoption of it. Infrastructure Ontario has, has used it for a couple of their projects today, but the wider industry is, has not really used it right now. So that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, we also, sorry, Dennis. Oh, I say I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real challenge, right? Because we're just trying to, we're trying to set some standards and at least some in global standards that allows us to benchmark projects from across the globe, but it helps influence clients' decisions at the outset. So, you know, we've got the ICMS, we've, there's some ISO standards that we use, ISO 19650, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we've got a couple of members from Turner and Townsend on the Canadian Working Group that's looking to develop the Canadian Annex of that. Cool. You mentioned it earlier about BIM, and so we know the BIM forum. Again, we've got a couple of of team team members that are involved in this and developing the standardised LODs that will help us standardise the data within the models, and therefore can extract that into the estimates, which allows, as you know, like flow through right the way from conceptual design all the way through to the as builds through to operation, which is. You know, we chatted to a client a couple of weeks ago that was saying, albeit it's a fairly small job in comparison to some others, but you know, for the, it's the first time I've heard a client turn around and say, you know what, we're going to really use the model and help us operate our building. So yeah. it's important that data is right from the get-go. And it was just music to a lot of the people who are in that meeting's ears, right? It's It's been a long time coming that if you go back 20 years, I think probably BIM and, and the whole ideology of that really started and it's taken us a long time to get to where yeah. we've got to. We're not even close to being there yet, right? I mean, it's tough. No, it's it's crazy. So it, it's interesting. Um, I've I've got a guest coming up in a couple of weeks here. Is uh, Nigel Stroud from Heathrow Airport? Oh yeah. So we'll be talking about you know how they manage such massive amounts of data capture from conception all the way to finish. And I, I don't know if you work with them, uh, but it's it's we do. Yeah, it's it's crazy. To yeah, watch. I'm hoping so, it would say. I'm hoping they'll say some good things about us. We had a, a lot of, that was a, a, an anchor point of our UK business uh, and has been for 15 or 20 years. We have, we had over 250 people on, on Heathrow. Yeah. But um, with COVID again, it's obviously the aviation industry has took a massive hit. And so we've had to demobilize a number of those, of those staff members, but Heathrow remain a, a key client of ours in, in the UK and, and the aviation sector as well. I mean, we've had, some great success in, in utilizing what we've done on Heathrow um, with BIM, with data capture, moving that over to, to Denver Airport. We had a number of people at the GTAA here in Toronto. We had a number of people on the core program at YVR. 
Uh, we've been helping at the Hong Kong International Airport, the new one, the one in Singapore. You know, there's a number of, and that's just one asset class where we've ha- we've been able to utilize our the data that we're we're capturing globally and helping inform the client's decisions in other jurisdictions. No, it's been great, and you know, I, there's a I've been blessed to have a network of uh, of individuals in the facilities management divisions, and you know, seeing the translation of data and how that's changed over the years, uh, especially over just even the past you know six to eight years, has been. Uh, phenomenal, you know, Ohio State University adopting standards for, you know, 300 and some odd different buildings. We've got, uh, you know, they're writing the book on how essentially ISO 19650 is playing out and how it's adapting to the North American markets. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so, I mean, obviously there's a lot of technology behind this. Uh, is there anything you could tell us about the uh, the technology that you haven't already or? Yeah, I mean, we so you know we use the off-the-shelf stuff that that exists in the market. But what we've we started a digital transformation journey, and when I say started it, we're we're kind of you know probably three quarters of the way through it at this point in time. And so we've developed something called the Hive internally, which allows us to ingest the market data, normalize it, analyze it, and and fundamentally present it in a in a meaningful format for both our internal needs, but also the external use as well. And, you know, we're, pr- we're pretty proud of, of that solution that we've come up with. Uh, it's, it's, we're on, as I say, we're on the journey right now. The UK where it, it started has really put a lot of effort into developing this. So now we're, we're in the process of regionalizing that myself and another individual from our Tampa office, Dan Diorostegi, we're leading the charge in North America to get our, uh, cost management and project management services utilizing the the hive mm-hmm. uh, there's a couple of components to it one is the market rate app which feeds into costex from a, an estimating perspective then we have the benchmarking app which a lot of our signature clients across the globe have really honed in on and said okay well this is great stuff uh, obviously we face the issue of confidentiality as we always do with benchmarking but yeah. we're finding a way around that yeah. um, and and then the third app we've built is a cost control app, which is essentially a an automated process for developing our monthly cost reports, which go out to a client. So it's intuitive. We're happy with it. It's still a journey, as I say, um, but fundamentally, it's utilizing, enhancing the technology that that's out there in the market, putting together our own bespoke solution. And over the course of the next three to six months, we'll be launching that in North America to the benefit of our clients. So watch this space in that one, Dennis. Hey, yeah, I'm really excited to see it. Uh, I'll be the first one to test it. That's for sure. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of um, large scale home builders who do uh, production. And I've used countless numbers of different um, estimating and costing softwares out there. And it's always it, there's always a detach from the actual process itself and uh, usually yeah. end up finding that there's an estimating office off to the side in a broom closet and they're just <laughs> hacking away at excel sheets well that's that role has obviously changed so i mean with with this new technology coming out how, how do you do you think this is possibly going to be diminishing the role of the cost consultant do you see that happening here yeah i mean if i if, if that question is asked to me once it's asked to me a thousand times and has been more frequently over the over the last 12 months as people have seen that we're actually able to operate not outside of that broom closet then it's, yeah. I mean, it is it's absolutely frightening that the industry in canada in particular still sees the cost consultant as being an estimator and was you know we're yep. desperately trying to get the industry to see that we're just we're much more than that exactly um you know, the takeoff component of our estimate production will be automated. You know, that, that, that's a fact. Mm-hmm. With BIM, with the advent of, of technology, further technology in, in terms of our, how to do our business, we can't resist that, nor should we. But the advisory component of what we do and the market knowledge and the experience and the client advocacy and project advocacy that a cost consultant does, that's fundamental to our service, perhaps more than the takeoff component, and it should never be undervalued, but we do tend to see in the market that it is so, and that when we respond to our RFPs, it's always a, you know, just do a class D or just do a class C, and we find it, it's just too commoditized. Yep. It, yep. You know, it, it, it's 
throw a number over the fence, you don't like it. The project team then has to go and do some value engineering, which is a term I personally dislike. Mm-hmm. And there's just no value in that at all. But you know, if if what we're trying to achieve now is okay, fine. Our fees are our fees, and, and unfortunately at times it, it's not, you know, it is a race to the bottom, but that's just professional services, generally speaking. We try and avoid that as a business as much as we can. But we get it, again, the other question that gets asked to us is, well, your fees are going to reduce, right? Because you no longer have to do the, the kind of laborious task of takeoffs. It's like, well, no, because the value that you're going to get as a client is that we will work with, you know, an organization that's developing the model, We'll incorporate it into Costex. We'll do all the kind of takeoff stuff. But the value in that strategic advice and the market knowledge remains. And so you're actually paying for more face time. Of course. So it's going to be more beneficial to you. And in fact, you know, if we can help organizations set up a model correctly for our perspective, i.e. we can take the information out of it that we need to take out of it. And we're doing that right now. A guy called David Thompson in our, uh, Canadian business is working hard with uh, with that with myself and a few others. Mm-hmm. Then it allows us freedom and a bit more time to actually come in and do things that we're supposed to be doing, providing procurement advice, providing that risks and stuff. And so, in theory, your fees. I'd love our fees to go up. Don't get me wrong, oh, yeah. but we're just yeah, we're just changing that view of of the service being a commoditized service oh, into a much more of a project controls focus, cost time and risk. Yeah, and that's the one thing too. Like we we deal with this a lot in the architecture industry in terms of not just architecture, engineering, everything. Uh, when we're starting to, you know, get into generative design and programming in, you know, new new waves, we're not diminishing diminishing roles. We're enhancing value offer. So okay. we we're producing a a new a new capability to produce more. Um, more variety to the client and it's uh it's great to see it happening in all aspects and not just a few so, so. yeah i mean one thing is clear is that the bim process won't replace the cost consultant no yeah it's going to enhance the role like uh, you just said it's going to enhance the role of all of us if we use it in the right way mm-hmm. and we make sure we don't pivot too much to a re- an exclusive reliance on data um, that there remains an element of subjectivity within what we all do as professionals, then I think that it's only going to enhance service offering to what you just said. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, with the, with the mindset of enhancement, you know, do you, do you see a massive change in terms of how the, the look of the cost consultant will be in the next three to 10 years? Like, what, what do you foresee the future of cost consultancy being? I hope it changes, Dennis. I, I really do. <laughs> You know, I think I've been in Canada now for 10 years and a lot of people have come, much more smarter people have come before me and there'll be a lot more smarter people after me. But, you know, there is a, every day I wake up, I think today's going to be the day where we'll change the view and the perspective of what a cost consultant to do. And that's what keeps me driven. And in that 10 years I've been here, I have seen a shift, definite shift. And, you know, I can only look at our own business where, as I said to you before, we've got three segments, infrastructure, real estate, and natural resources. Mm-hmm. In each one of those segments, we are providing cost, time, and risk management on the three largest programs that exist in those segments in Canada. Center block for real estate, the Metrolinx Gold Program for infrastructure, and LNG Canada for natural resources. So that that is a, is a message for us, which... If these major programs understand the value of what a cost consultant can do in that sphere, then we'd like to think that that will change the way that the industry views us just at large. And, you know, it's not that that process is going to fit every single project. Of course not. But it's just the the sheer understanding that the federal government in particular is now seeing the role of the cost consultant and said, okay, well, we, we, we need somebody like this to come in and to what you said at the start and manage the project from a cost perspective, understand the risk, blend it all together. Because I don't remember ever being involved in a project where somebody doesn't ask the question at some point, hey, how much does this cost? Yeah. Or are we on budget? Or what does that do to the price of a project? So 
you know, I, I, I'd like to think that the journey that we've been on as a profession in, in North America, but specifically Canada for the last 10 years, I'd like to think that there'd be a, a, sh a continuing shift towards what I've just outlined there. And that is the, the view that the cost consultant can provide that proactive way of managing cost time and risk rather than sometimes the reactionary appointment that's more highly commoditized than what it should be at this time. Yeah. I can only dream in this. Oh, I, you know what? It's, it's not a far-fetched dream. And, you know, with the, with the way that data is going and with product lifecycle tracking, you know, you'll now have that, uh, at least have that, be able to see how your service is in action even after the project has been built, like to, to be able to get resources to help you pinpoint your data for future projects. Like the, yeah. this whole machine learning and data mining applications that are in now have changed the industry in so many good ways. And, you know, it, integrating, you know, cost consultancy into this whole process, like that for the client will pay the bills any day, like quite literally. It should do. I mean, yeah. one of the things funny, one of, one of my, uh, one of my longest serving clients that I've worked with in Canada since I've been in the country has always said, Darren, you know, you should be tracking here how much you're saving us on a, on a daily or a weekly basis. <laughs> At the start, I was always, you know, paid it a bit of lip service, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah, yeah. But then about four, four or five years ago, he turned around to me and said, right, we've got this project coming up. I need you to go and sit in front of my boss and provide him with the analysis that I've been asking you to keep for the past five years. And it was amazing how my mind just switched to like, holy smokes, that's a, why haven't I, why haven't I been listening to this guy? Mm -hmm. You know, because the one thing, the one way we can demonstrate value to a client is, hey, you know, contractors number came in at this. We did our own assessment. We thought it was this. We met somewhere in the middle, let's just say. That saving was a million, two million, three million, whatever it might be that, Again, it's difficult to judge as to whether or not that would have been negotiated away without us. But what we can say is that that was negotiated away with us. Um, and so it's, it's being able to demonstrate that value. And for us, it's almost self-serving, which doesn't come easily to us as a professional because we're just doing our job. But when you look at that savings that we inevitably generate for a client during a construction project, that compared to our fee, is minimal and i'd love to be able to say you know hey can we have a percentage of anything that we save you <laughs> but uh, unfortunately that's not the way our profession works and quite rightly so because we want to be independent of the process yeah right we don't want to be seen to be benefiting from a project cost going up equally you know I'm, <laughs> stakeholders will say well we don't necessarily want to benefit from or de benefit from you doing your job properly, driving the cost down, which means our fees go down. Yeah, yeah. So that's why we always maintain that independency and having a lump sum approach that isn't reflected on the on the bottom line number of the project. It just it, it makes sense for our profession to do that. But yeah, I don't know. Like it, it's it, on the one hand, it's important for us to demonstrate our value, but in the other on the other hand, it's difficult for us to not be overly self serving by doing that. But it's a it's a tricky balancing act at the moment and it always has been yeah definitely and, and you know what and i i always like to call or call it the embodiment of a project because uh a lot of people tend to look at it as you know just the finance like the or just the uh the dollar value of it but you you have to take a look at it from from a whole life cycle analysis when you see cost consultancy you you think about somebody from another consultant uh, group, whether it could be a, an engineer, a contractor, a sub consultant, uh, whomever, is taking a part of their day to go and procure items for a client and identify cost analysis and do all of this stuff. Meanwhile, they could be focusing on their construction, on their architectural design, their whatever sure. it might be. And those, that overall embodiment of a project is something that is is lost in that and having somebody to take that role and put it into an easy to use scenario it's under it's undervalued to say the least so yep awesome so i mean 
we've seen the challenges we've seen the impacts of you know how uh, a cost consultant's role is on a project so how would you say that um the uh, cost consultants value for money or the quality of budgets is being impacted like for the client um yeah I mean, you know it goes back to what i was saying yeah, the, same, yeah. the way the, yeah the way the industry sees us is, is a bit outdated um so we've just got to continue flying the flag and yep. as i say utilizing the projects that we have some great clients as a business and our peers in the industry have their own great clients as well and it's just continuing to promote the role in a, in a proactive way mm-hmm. rather than it being seen as a, as a reactive way yep. <clears throat> and if we can continue to do that work together as a as a profession which we do through the RICS and CIQS and, and other organizations and providing that we're all talking the same yeah yep. in principle we all, we all have our differences as organizations just to just as yours does, right, Dennis? So it, it's fine balancing that need of, of having your unique selling point as an organization versus promoting the profession. So I, I sit on the RICS Americas board mm-hmm. and, you know, I've got fellow cost consultants on there too and, and project managers and valuers and you name it. So at that level, trying to keep up the, keep up the brand of the profession is one thing, and I know I say my peers in the industry do very excellent work, and, and there are their own uh, their own professionals at the CIQS and CACQS and others. But I, you know, we have to for my own sanity, I have to hope that it changes. Yeah, <laughs> gotta keep waking up in the morning and and assuming that today is going to be the day where you know the majority of the industry will will understand finally what it is that we can do and. And again, I think there is this misconception that all the cost consultant does is just estimate. And whilst that is a yeah. an important part of what we do, it, it's not everything. And I think the sooner or the or the quicker that our clients and the clients at large realise that, then they'll see that the value for money that you get from a professional in this in this instance is going to be significantly more than what you're going to pay them from a fee perspective. So it's not all doom and gloom, Dennis. But yeah. No, you know, there's, we'll, uh, we'll keep flying that flag as we say, and, and hopefully, over the coming, you know, again, the data aspect of it, the technology aspect of it, is something which, as an industry, I think we've really fallen foul of. We, I read something from McKinsey a few years back that said, I think there's only the ag- agricultural and, and forestry industries that ha- are, have adopted technology less than the construction industry, <laughs> and. I don't know whether that's true anymore, but it was a, it was a pretty mind-boggling statistic that they came up with. And so, yeah. you know, if we can, I know some of our competitors are, are on the journey with us as well. So if we can just be on that journey together and showcase what we can do from a digital transformation perspective, then I think all, all roles point in the right direction. And there's a bit of hope there that the industry will start understanding the value of what we can do. Well, I, I think that's uh, the key item there. Get yourself a cost consultant. So it's uh, it's very important yeah. for a project. The um, so I mean, with, with that being said, you know, all humor aside, it's like, do you, do you have any advice on how a client can determine a best fit for for a service such as yours, or for the variety of services, I guess? Yeah, I mean, you know, in other jurisdictions there is this embodiment of this full end-to-end cost management. Mm-hmm. And that's ultimately where we want to get to, Dennis. However, you know, there's a definite recognition that it's probably not going to be possible here right now for, you know, here in Canada, mm-hmm. for a couple of years yet. So we'll always have a shopping list that will satisfy our clients. And part of it will be estimating, part of it will be scheduling, part of it will be risk management, and then the post-contract side as well. Um, you know, our own issues as a business is that our sweet spot is somewhere between a million bucks in capital expenditure and 10 billion. And, you know, it's difficult. And we, we, we follow the same process fundamentally on, on those projects. And so our service has to be elastic. And so we'll provide the services across that spectrum from a million dollar project to a $10 billion project. Obviously, it will be dependent on 
the level of um, of actual individuals you'll get working on that program. But you know, I guess the, the kind of call to arms here for the for this podcast in particular is is that if you're investing in a major capital expenditure program, irrespective of the sector or the segment, then you want us with you. You know, as a profession, we know what we're doing. Turner and Townsend, we know what we're doing. And part of the issue is that we seem to have settled into this pattern of providing a commoditized, uh, commoditized service, and we're not challenging the status quo as much as we should do. So, you know, we think we can fit, as I say, anywhere in, in the project life cycle. Ideally, we'd be there from the start. We can add more value there. You know, we've got great relationships in the market with collaborators, architects, engineers, clients, suppliers, contractors. You know, we do a lot of work in the integrated project delivery space right now. So that for us is a, is a kind of a, it's a challenge, but it's also a, a massive opportunity for us because to be honest with you, Dennis, I don't think we've even scratched the surface as to what we can do in the Canadian market. Um, certainly our business, if you asked, yeah, that's and exciting. Ten people, you know, where who would turn around Townsend? We, you know, we'd like to think that the majority of them would know, but have the majority of them used us to our fullest extent? Absolutely not. So that's the exciting component here. Yeah, lots, lots of room for uh, for growth, both both in the uh, social and uh, and economical standpoint. That's uh, that's fantastic. You know, it's it's been really great to to have you online here, Darren, because uh, I think this is a, a part of the industry that has been that that really really needs to come out a lot more, especially with all of the data being transferred from left to right. Like that, the whole industry has changed for the better in terms of being able to track data and, and all kinds of different areas. So. Thanks again, Darren, for coming online. This has been really educational for me, and I'm sure the the fans listening to the show are gonna pick up on a few things. And thank you, thanks again. No worries, thanks. All right, well, that's it, everyone. Tune in for our next uh, next week's presentation. We have a bunch of really cool guests coming up the line, and for now, just keep on bimming. Take care, everyone. <laughs>